Hello and welcome. Welcome to uh, week four of our Encore class. And we had introduced Boethius last week. And so today we're going to be looking at how uh, in, in that work of the Constellation of Philosophy that we had talked about last week, how Boethius is going to use some uh, some really important and what will end up being some really famous examples of uh, the model uh, or some some ideas of how this this sort of circular cosmos, this living dynamic cosmos works. Um, and so that's what we're going to dig in with today. Uh, We will be using this edition of the text. This is the uh, Oxford World Classics edition of the of the text uh, from 2008. Um, I encourage you to go out and, and, and if you don't have the book, uh, get the book. Uh, uh, I'm putting this on YouTube. Uh, YouTube is notorious for uh, uh, being picky about copyright uh, laws. Uh, we want to be sure that we we recognize that I am using this text and I am I am uh, the the this is where the information comes from. It, it may work, it may not. We'll we'll see how it goes. Uh, this is my first time putting um, reading from a text like this on YouTube, and uh, so uh, let's, let's fingers crossed. Hopefully everything works out okay. Um, all right. So let's go back and refresh ourselves just a little bit. I, I, I only want to take a couple of minutes to uh, be thinking about this uh, since we spent all last week uh, talking about it, but we, we did have a couple of people missing. Um, if, if we remember, uh, Boethius writes the Constellation of Philosophy as he's in prison, perhaps under house arrest. Uh, he claims that he has been... Um, unjustly imprisoned and unjustly accused. He, he claims to be innocent. Um, and indeed, maybe he was. We have no way of knowing. Uh, and and so this, uh, this working out of the constellation of philosophy is uh, in, in a lot of ways, um, in, in a lot of ways, uh, doing a couple of things. Uh, one, answering that question, why do bad things happen to good people? But also dealing with um, Boethius, the author, right, creating a sort of fictionalized version of himself to remind his fictionalized version of himself and the audience, the readers, that uh, the things that he seems to have lost, right, his wealth, his power, his position, uh, these things ultimately are not the things that satisfy, right? The 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 what what ultimately gives us peace and satisfaction and that, that idea of happiness we talked about last week, happiness as, as blessedness, right? And an eternal contentment that can't be taken away. Um, the highest good, the sumum bonum, right? That is ultimately where our satisfaction is found. And, and then he'll even use religious language uh, to talk about uh, the highest good, the sumum bonum as God. All right, so so that is a reminder of uh, what it is we're looking at, um, where we are, and, and what's going on. The first passage that we want to look at, and I, I have it actually on the next page, uh, but is from Book 2, Chapter 2 of the Constellation of Philosophy. Uh, and this is all of these passages that we'll be looking at today uh, are are pretty well known uh, among uh, people that that uh, have some familiarity with with Boethius and uh, through the Middle Ages they they presented images and ideas that stuck uh, and uh, hopefully I can I can give us some demonstrations about uh, sort of what that means or or what that looks like. Um, so here in the beginning of of Book Two. As we had said last week, uh, this this work is a philosophical dialogue, right? So it's a it's an imagined, fictionalized conversation between the character of Boethius and philosophy personified, 
And here at the beginning of book two, uh, Boethius has sort of been moaning and groaning. His, he's been griping about how his, his temporal goods have been taken away and he's, he's fallen on hard times, right? Uh, we, we might say that he's unfortunate or he has uh, come into some misfortune and he is complaining against this idea of fortune, right? That, that fortune is, uh, has, has taken away his temporary goods. And so uh, this is philosophy talking here, but she is imagining if you had a sort of personification of fortune, just like through this whole text, you have a personification of philosophy, but if, but if fortune were there to defend herself, what would she say, right? What would be her counter to Boethius's complaints? And so I want to look at this. Uh, this is book two, chapter two of the Consolation. It's, it's in your reading packets. And uh, this is, uh, it, it's technically philosophy talking, but she's, she's putting words into the mouth of fortune, if fortune were there to defend herself. And this is the this is an extended passage. Um, this is maybe the longest one that we'll read today, but it's also probably the easiest as well. So um, I, I just want to work through these passages together. So, so here is fortune to uh, Boethius. When nature brought you forth from your mother's womb, I adopted you. We, we might remember historically the author Boethius was was actually adopted so you, you get some of that adoption language uh when you were born I adopted you you were naked then and bereft of everything I nurtured you with my resources and this is what makes you so angry with me I bent over backwards to spoil you and to uh, give you a pampered upbringing I hedged you round with the glimmering panoply of all those riches rightfully mine. It now suits me to withdraw my gifts. You owe me a debt of gratitude for having enjoyed possessions not your own. Right? They were originally fortunes to give, they're fortunes to take away. You, know, you have no right to complain as if you lost what was indisputably yours. They were never his to begin with. Scrolling down a little bit. So why moan and groan? I have not laid violent hands on you. Wealth and position and all such things are at my discretion, says Fortune. These handmaids of mine acknowledge their mistress. They come with me and they retire when I depart. I can assert with confidence that if these possessions whose loss you lament had really been yours, you would certainly not have lost them, right? If, if there's something to, to be ours to begin with, we, we, we couldn't actually lose them. Uh, so she continues, uh, so am I alone to be for, forbidden to exercise my rights? The heavens are allowed to engender bright days and then to shroud them in dark nights. The earth is permitted at one time to adorn the face of the earth with blossoms and fruits and at another to plague it with rain clouds and freezing cold. It is the sea's right at one moment to smile indulgently with glassy waters and at another to bristle with storms and breakers. So when people's wishes are unfulfilled, will they confine me to uh, that to that consistent behavior, which is alien to my character, this power that I wield comes naturally to me. This is my perennial sport. I turn my wheel, fortune's wheel, or the wheel of fortune, right? I turn my wheel on its whirling axis and take delight in switching the base to the summit and the summit to the base. So mount upwards, if you will, but on condition that you do not regard yourself as ill-treated if you plummet down when my humor so demands and takes its course. So this is a pretty famous passage, right? This is, this is the image of uh, Fortune's Wheel that uh, through the Middle Ages and, and even into modernity, 
uh, people are going to be thinking about as as they think about uh, the the sort of changing nature of good fortune and bad fortune and and we get we get various images of this uh, throughout the Middle Ages and, and here are a couple and, and these are variations on uh, the same idea uh, and and this this literally is uh, a, a depiction of what we just read right where uh, where we have this sort of uh, privileged uh, well-fortuned individual at the top they're they're sitting there in control they they think they have it all sort of figured out no problems in the world um and then they they plummet down and and this the circle continues uh round and round and round and uh eventually squishes the person on the bottom but then it continues to turn and you can see this person sort of struggling on the side to, to climb up again. And eventually they, they get back up to the height or what Fortune there calls the summit. Um, and the, the wheel continues to turn. Uh, this, is, this is that image of Fortune uh, where, it's, where it's ever whirling, it's ever changing. Um, and, and the idea here is for Boethius that... Um, that nothing stays the same, right? He's he's out of sorts because he's lost his temporal goods. Uh, he's he's on hard times, and philosophy says, in putting words in Fortune's mouth, why moan and groan, right? Why why would this seem unnatural? What about this seems not right? We, we know that these things don't last. We know that these things are temporary. We know that fortune comes and goes. So, so why moan and groan? Uh, this, is, this is just part of the way uh, the sort of the nature or the character of fortune functions. Um, and if we flip back over the, to the text um, and scroll down a little bit, to the end of chapter three. Um, uh, so as, as I had said last week in class, uh, you might remember that, that uh, one of the interesting sort of literary stylistic aspects of this text is that uh, it, it alternates between prose and poetry. And so the the verse here, the meter at the end of book two, chapter three, uh, talks about this. And um, I'm going to sort of pass over for time the beginning of this verse, uh, sort of talking about, again, sort of some of these images of nature. Phoebus, this is that classical god of uh, the sun, it talks about Boreas, the one of the four winds associated with sort of the, the natural elements. Uh, but but look here at the end, right? It says, since in this world, inconsistency is sure and tempest changes are the rule, then trust in fleeting goods, you fool. Expect men's transient fortunes to endure. So it's it's foolish to expect that that uh, uh, men's fortunes would endure, or it would be foolish to trust in fortune. Philosophy continues, one thing is fixed by eternal law arranged. Nothing stands, nothing which comes to be remains unchanged. So the only thing that is fixed, the only thing that never changes, is change itself, right? That's the only thing that we can really, in, in this life, uh, according to sort of uh, the, the the nature of this world, right? We This is still book two. We don't get into the ideas of happiness and the highest good and and blessedness and, and God and all, and all of that stuff until book three. So, so the argument hasn't gotten there yet. Um, so in terms of these things that that Boethius is lamenting that he's lost, right? If if your perspective is is there, then you can be sure that the only thing that doesn't change is change itself. 
and and this is all this is all sort of centered around this image of um, fortune's wheel. Uh, the other sort of image that that I that I associate with this, and and you can sort of see this here, is but but sort of the idea of a Ferris wheel, right? You 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 go to the fair or the carnival or whatever, and you get down at the bottom and you ride the little car around and around and around. Um, fortunately, people aren't falling off ferris wheels or or we should say hopefully they don't i i suppose in uh, using this language right that would be very bad fortune uh if if you were to fall off uh we don't want anybody to be hurt uh but then this again this is uh, i think anyway a, a pretty um indelible image right it, it it has stamped itself at least in in my head so anytime now I, I i see a ferris wheel or even like a like a mill right a, a water wheel going round and round uh this is this is what comes to mind right fortune's wheel going around and around and around and we've seen we've already introduced we've talked about the sort of circular nature of the universe in this pre-modern sense and in in such a such a constant part of our life right the only thing that we can be sure of is is change the only thing that we can be sure of is that fortune is there's good fortune and there's bad fortune and it's it's constantly whirling on its axis um to to such an integral part of our earthly lives that idea of a, a of a circle is uh, really going to stick with uh, people from the Middle Ages. These images uh, are later. Y you you might remember that we said last week Boethius is living around the turn of the sixth century, right around the year five hundred eighty. These images come later in the Middle Ages. Uh, the the sort of yellowish one on the left is from um, like the eleven and twelve hundreds, and the one on the right, which is more colorful, it it. it it speaks a little bit more to a, a almost kind of more Renaissance style of art. This is, um, I don't have the dates in front of me, 13, 1400s. So this is a little bit later, but but right in contrast to in, in thinking about that with Boethius, right? That's seven, eight, 900 years later. Uh, and, and people are still reading Boethius there. This image is sticking out to them. Um, really having an impact on the way that people are thinking about fortune um, and in this circular sort of way. So that's the first image that we wanted to look at from Boethius is the idea of fortune. And the the next image here is deals with fate and providence. Um, I do not have a good image uh, to show us, to demonstrate the ideas here from uh, Boethius's Constellation of Philosophy. And, and we'll look at the passage in a minute. But I, I do want us to, I, I wanted to give some sort of visualization first uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, this is probably the most complicated passage uh, that we're going to look at today, or or at least the, the visual image that Boethius suggests to us is, uh, and and the ideas that he's the the ways that he's talking about it are are perhaps the the least clear, um, and so we I I really think that we need something to imagine something to hold on to as as we're reading the text. Unfortunately, though, <laughs> and uh, uh, I have to laugh about it because it's there's there's a certain. Uh, uh, maybe dark irony to it uh as as complicated as it is you would think that this would be the most necessary sort of image to to have and the internet gave me nothing <laughs> I, I spent uh a long time i don't know how long but a long time uh digging through uh image searches trying to find a representation of what we're about to read i couldn't find anything um so so what I ended up doing was uh, we've got this sort of swing image um, attached to whatever it's it's hanging from by chains, and we'll we'll see sort of this language, this imagery of uh, chains connecting to a to a midpoint uh, as we read the text. Um, but 
but notice here there are uh, this image might be a little bit hard to see on the PowerPoint, but but the swing does have uh, concentric circles within it, right? It's, it's made up of um, not maybe separate circles individually, but but there's a sort of concentric circle texture or at least uh, appearance to the swing. Um, and we've talked about concentric circles uh, in the previous weeks. Uh, keeping that in mind, this is a, a continuing aspect of uh, this cosmos. Um, and and here the 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 swing is connected to a to an axis or a midpoint up above. Uh, try to flatten this image into a sort of two dimensional sort of diagram where these concentric circles are attached to the midpoint of the the concentric circles uh, by by chains uh, going from the middle outward. So um, I as this is a little bit more complicated, I, I just wanted to introduce the idea the sort of image first before we read it. Um, and we'll come back over here to our text and I will, uh, excuse me while I scroll down. Uh, uh, yeah, to this page here. All right, so um, you may have noticed on that PowerPoint slide, uh, we had talked about uh, you, it was titled Fate and Providence, right? And so uh, here now we have come into book four of the Constellation of Philosophy. So we've, we've for, the, for the purposes of our discussion here today, we've skipped over book three, right? Where, where that, those ideas of happiness and, and the highest good and, and God, all those sort of meteor ideas are introduced. Um, and, and Boethius, the character of Boethius is his, uh, attention, his perspective has been shifted away from the temporal transitory things uh, of this life that he's lamenting. And, and now he's thinking about more heavenly, eternal things. Uh, but by book four, he's, he's, he's still concerned about this idea of justice. And he's still concerned about this idea that, that how is it that a good God can allow bad things to happen? Right. If, if God is in control, if God is sovereign, if God is supreme, if God is, in fact, the highest good and justice is a good. Few, few people would dispute that that justice is a is a good thing. And if all good things are combined in the highest good, as we talked about last week, then then how is it that the highest good allows for bad things to happen? And, and so this gets into conversations about fate and providence, right? How, how is it that the highest good can allow the bad things on earth to transpire? And so we get now to this second famous uh, image that Boethius presents to us. And, and again, you'll notice that it's couched in terms of a circular cosmos and, and concentric circles of, of being. Uh, this is this is again a little bit a little bit dense, and also uh, I apologize. Uh, you you may have uh, heard some uh, uh, running around of the dog, some barking of the dog. He's apparently jumping on things upstairs. I I don't know if any of that audio is coming through. Uh, I do apologize. Right, this the, these are the things that happen when. Uh, we work at home in a, in a pandemic. Okay, um, so back to our discussion here of fate and providence. Uh, hence, all that is subordinate to fate is likewise subject to providence, to which fate itself is subject. So, so fate are those those the the sort of outworking of of um, what's supposed to happen here on earth, the, the outworking of events here on earth, right? Subject to providence, right? Fate itself is subject to providence. That is to say, uh, sort of God's knowledge, God's will. But there are some things under the aegis of providence which transcend the chain of fate. There's that language of chains. Such things are uh, planted immovably close to the supreme Godhead so that they lie outside the regime of changeability 
managed by fate, right? We talked about fortune and how the, the transitory temporal stuff of this world is, is always changing. Well, those events of this world governed by fate are changing, but the Supreme Godhead that highest good that we talked about, one of the thing, one of the good things these Neoplatonists would ascribe to the highest good would be unchangeability, right? So, so there are there are some things planted immovably close to the supreme Godhead, so that they lie outside the regime of changeability managed by fate. Imagine a series of concentric circles. So here we have this this image. Right? Imagine a series of concentric circles revolving around the same axis. The innermost one lies closest to the single nature of the central point and itself acts as a sort of axis around which the other circles uh, lying outside it can turn. All right, so, so each circle turns sort of the circles uh, beyond it. The outermost circle travels round in a wider circle and the further it departs from the undivided middle point the more widespread is the area over which it extends. Should anything ally and attach itself to the midpoint, it is absorbed into an undivided nature and it ceases to be separate and to spread in all directions. Similarly, whatever distance itself further from the highest mind or the highest good or God, um, whatever distances itself further from the highest mind becomes enmeshed in the broader chains of fate that those those ideas of the sort of changeable things of this life where where good and bad things good and bad fortune can happen whereas the closer to the axis of the world which a thing approaches the freer it becomes excuse me while i scroll over here uh the freer it becomes from the controls of fate if in fact a thane clings fast to the unchanging nature of the divine mind, it becomes motionless and it also passes beyond the necessity imposed by fate. As the power of reasoning relates to the intellect, as becoming is to being, as time is to eternity, as a circle is to a midpoint. So, so these are all sort of things that go out and are sort of lesser sort of reflections or, 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 or images of um, the, the truer self, right? So um, uh, as reasoning relates to the intellect, right? Uh, reasoning is good, but you can't do it without the intellect, right? Uh, becoming as something becomes more of something, it's good, but you can't have becoming without being. A circle needs a midpoint, right, to, to be the center of it, to fix it, to, to hold that circle in place so it doesn't get all wibbly wobbly and oblong and misshapen and right. A, a circle needs a midpoint to focus around. So, so with all of those things, so is the shifting chain of fate related to the unchanging oneness of providence. Okay, so that's confusing. Right. Uh, so, so we come back here to this to this image of the tire swing. And again, if we could smush this down into a sort of two dimensional image, we have all of these concentric circles tied to the midpoint by chains, right? And they're all revolving around the midpoint. And and the the farther out from the midpoint you go, the uh, and and remember the midpoint is un, unchangeable goodness, the highest good, God Himself. So the further away you get from unchanging goodness, the, the more changeable things become. And, and the, the more subject to the sort of fate of the outworking of the temporal world, uh, things, things are subject. Uh, however, the closer into the axis uh, a, a circle is, the tidal, tighter the circle is. It, it covers less area. It is, it is bound more to, it changes less is subject to less to the changeability of fate. Um, and, and this all ties back into one of those big ideas that we talked about at the end of class, this idea of divine simplicity, right? That, that all good things are combined into 
the singularity, the singleness of God. There's there's no complexity to God, right? God isn't made up of a, a bunch of different parts. God is just one single thing. And part of that one single thing is his unchangeableness. And so so here Boethius is worried about um about changingness and 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 evil and badness and injustice and and how can bad things happen when you have a supreme good god who is unchanging well the closer you get to god the the less affected bad things might happen certainly still uh but but the less one would be affected by the changes of fate until until ultimately right the the goal here is to be ultimately united in god uh so that we can not that we become god ourselves but that we can participate in his in his goodness right that that he can share that goodness with us um this is that image and and like I said, this is one of the harder ideas of the constellation. Um, it is it is not one that um, when I'm teaching undergrads, I I typically like to spend a lot of time on just because it, it is a little bit hard. I think for our modern minds that aren't used to thinking in these ways to wrap wrap our heads around in in these ways, uh, but it is again, sort of a famous image from the constellation and one that really and, and kind of intensely taps into this sort of circular and concentric model of the universe. And this is an image that we saw before and I'm, I'm anticipating for the next couple of weeks, Dante will be our next author that we're reading after Boethius. And, and this is the sort of cosmos as presented in Dante. And so I'm not interested in the, in the particular maybe geography of this image right the various um planets or spheres or 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 aspects of the afterlife um and again i've got a got a loud truck going by so the dog might bark he does not care for the loud trucks uh but but what i do like about this image and i i may have pointed this out in the first video um when when we saw this image before uh, but this this image does connect to what we've been talking about here with with Boethius and fate and providence, in that the 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 positioning of God, the sort of relative positioning of God to the cosmos, to reality, and to our position in reality, is almost paradoxical. Right, and, and there's an inversion to this, where on the one hand, um, God is infinite, right? God is God is at the at at, at the at, 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 uh, God encompasses all of creation. There is there is nothing, no place in which God is not. There is there is nothing in which God cannot contain. Right. God is God is bigger than all of that, and so so here in this diagram, you, right, the the Empyrean, the heaven of heavens, the the location of God, uh, where blessedness is found. Remember this idea from from Boethius is is this idea of uh, approaching happiness or the highest good or or blessedness, union with God. Right, that infinite God is is at the bounds of what possibly could be, right. But at the same time. All of creation, all of the cosmos, all of everything, right, is bound together by God. And in, in this view of, if we back up just for a moment, of this idea of the of the cosmos, of fate, of, of the outworking of um, events, right, is a, in the cosmos as a series of concentric circles, all of that is tied together to a midpoint to a singular soul, undivided, unchanging midpoint, which is God. And so at the same time that God is infinite, God is singular. 
at the same time that he is outside and beyond anything that we could possibly imagine, he is still at the midpoint of it all. As we approach God, our understanding of the cosmos both expands and enfolds upon itself, enfolds upon God. And that to me is a pretty remarkable thing. All right. Um, this is uh, book four, chapter six that we've been looking at, um, Fate and Providence. Again, one of the more trickier passages here. Um, and uh, as I said, it's it's a conversation that I, I usually don't spend a lot of time on because uh, this, is, this is the longest chapter of the book and I'm pulling out a singular paragraph out of that. Uh, so there's certainly more to be said here. And uh, I am trained as a, as a as a historian, not as a philosopher. I'm sure that there are people who are trained in philosophy who could uh, understand this and explain it a lot better than I could and uh, talk circles, uh, pun not intended, but but certainly could leave me in their dust and in, in, in ways of uh, thinking about this and, and talking about it. Uh, but for our purposes here, as we as we think about these sort of images of understanding the cosmos, we're we're going to leave it at that. All right. And so now we'll come back to our text. And, and, and again, um, you'll excuse me as I scroll down here. Uh, so, so we've dealt with fortune. We've dealt with the, uh, or, or at least we've addressed it, right? I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that in, in this video, we're going to solve the problem of fortune or we're going to solve the problem of fate and providence. And, and certainly the next problem that we're going to tackle uh, is one that I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest to give a final answer to. And uh, it's, it's a question that people have been wrestling with for thousands of years. Uh, and, and so in a, in a short uh, section of a one hour video, uh, certainly we're not going to uh, uh, solve all of the problems here with, with this next with this next question. Um, but it is it is an important answer that Boethius gives. Uh, it is again an image, a visualization uh, that that resonates with people and, and people have hung on to. Uh, I, I should say not everybody buys the explanation that uh, Boethius is going to give here, uh, but it has a long traction in the history of ideas. Of course, the the problem that I'm talking about, the problem that people for thousands of years have been debating and and continue to debate, and and uh, it, it's 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 hard for us to to wrap our heads around is the problem of providence. This again, this idea of God's knowledge. Uh, and his will, what, what God knows, what God wants to happen. And if God is supreme, if God is sovereign, if God knows everything, how is it possible then, Boethius asks in book five, can we humans have free will? Right? If God knows everything that's going to happen, how do we have the freedom to choose what he already knows is going to happen? And so here in uh, uh, book five, chapter six, Boethius suggests an answer to that. Again, you may or may not find it satisfactory. I'm, I'm, I'm not here to 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 say this is the answer, but I'm I'm I, I want to present it as an answer, right? That Boethius had given in the five hundreds, and an answer that had stuck with people for a long time. Um, so uh, looking here, this is, if you're following along at home, I, I've not been giving page numbers and I, I apologize for that. This is, this is page 111, okay, in, in the Oxford uh, Constellation of Philosophy. Uh, it's book five, chapter six. Um, 
and here again, this is philosophy speaking to Boethius, and, and she says, uh, therefore, since every judgment which is made comprehends the things lying before it according to its own nature, and since God's nature is abidingly eternal in the present, uh, we probably should have started in, in the chapter above, in the paragraph above. Uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, sort of jump into this though, uh, right? And I'll, I'll explain this idea of uh, God's God's presentness in a moment. Um, and since uh, God's status is abidingly eternal and in the present, His knowledge too transcends all movements in time. It abides in the simplicity of its present, embraces the boundless extent of the past and future, and you'll excuse me, I've got to uh, switch over here. Uh, and by virtue of its simple comprehension, it ponders all things as if they were being enacted in the present. Hence, your judgment will be more correct should you seek to envision, en envision the foresight uh by which God discerns all things, not as a sort of, and this is this is sort of the important point here. Uh, if if we can imagine, if we can envision, so so again, we're we're sort of using a mental picture here to try to understand this, these naughty questions. If we can imagine, or if we can envision, the foresight by which God discerns all things, not as a sort of foreknowledge of the future, knowing ahead of time. But as knowledge of the increase of the unceasingly present moment, for this reason, it is better to term it providentia, the Latin prefix pro, meaning looking forward spatially, rather than providentia, the Latin prefix pri, or what we would say pre. Be looking beforehand, looking forward in time, All right? So this is this is the difference between looking spatially and and looking chronologically or or, or temporally. Um, for it is not set far apart from the lowliest of things, and it gazes out on everything as from one of the world's lofty peaks. So we have here this image of looking out from a lofty peak. And so if we come back over here to our PowerPoint, and this is, of course, from Rock City on Lookout Mountain uh, down just outside Chattanooga, right? And, and this, is, uh, this, is, this is the spot, right? This is the spot where you can see seven states at once, right? You're, you're, you're high enough. You've got a vantage point far enough removed from ground level that at one singular moment you can see seven different states in the united states right and this is this is um this is a material physical uh, uh temporal place where humans can go we can go and we can see out vast distances all all at once uh, in, in 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 one singular glance right and the idea here is that God is so removed from time that he can see the past, the present, and the future all in a single glance. All right, so we need to back up a little bit and to, to work some things out. And to do this, we need to go back to that idea of that we mentioned a few moments ago, and, and we had introduced last week, of divine simplicity. Right, where where all good things are combined into a single undivided goodness in God, right? God is the highest good. All good, He is all the good things. Right? There's there's no good thing that you can imagine that that God is not. Um, unchangeableness is one of those things that we mentioned, but also as part of that unchangeableness, then is God's eternal nature, right? Uh, being beyond time, being beyond the confines of time that passes away, right? Uh, time is one of those created things that is and then is not, right? The present moment is right now, and then we've already passed that moment 
and it's gone. That is now the past. What I, what I had said was the present is now our past. It changes, it moves on, it passes away. And in this model of um, things changing, being less good than the highest possible good, the highest possible good then has to be eternal. It has to be beyond time. It can't change with time. And so for God, in his eternal nature, he is not moving through time as we are. The future for him is not the future. For the past for him is not the past. Instead, because again, in this singular, simple Godhead that is not divided into separate parts, there's not part of God that's in the past. There's not part of God that's in the future, but instead all of God is right now, right? All of time for God, and I apologize again for the for the dog, but all of time for God is right now in a, in a singular undivided moment. And so for God, the past is right now, the future is right now, everything is right now for God. And so as he looks out from his eternal vantage point, just like when we go up to Rock City, we can see seven states at the same time. So from God's vantage point, he can see everything that has already happened, everything that's going to happen, everything that might possibly happen. All of that happen. All God, God sees that providentia, right? Pro in front of us, videntia from the, uh, from the Latin video to, to see video videre, um, God sees forth spatially all singularly right now. And so just because he's seeing what to us are future actions, he's seeing it at in the present, right? Those, those things for us that are future are present for him doesn't make a necessary that we will necessarily have to make those choices, right? Uh, I was, as I was preparing for today, I was looking at, at some things, and 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 one commentary on this, uh, this might might be in the notes at the back of your book, even uh, says just as if we were to witness uh, two cars running into each other. Uh, doesn't make it necessary that that would have happened just because we see it happen in front of us doesn't make those those actors necessarily have to make those choices so just just because god sees it in his eternal present uh we still have the freedom to make the choices as uh as morally free agents um and and so again this is this is one answer to the problem of providence and free will. Uh, it, it is, again, an answer that a lot of people um, built on and thought about and, and, and was had a lot of traction for a long time. Again, I am not a philosopher. I am a historian. Uh, as I understand it, uh, there are modern historians that, or excuse me, modern philosophers that, that find this image this model this this understanding of providence and free will right uh, insufficient or or it, it doesn't explain all of the the problems that that you you might suppose um i i am not suggesting that this is the be all and the end all model but it is it is a suggestion that boethius gave that had important adherence for a long time through the middle ages and again uh there is a there is a resonance here with this image of um, God's providence from a singular point, looking from from as if it were on top of a mountain, looking out from the summit of the mountain, out at all of the cosmos before him. Right, this is not unlike this image, where God from a singular point can outlook all of creation not just the physical space but the the temporal time of from the beginning of creation to the final judgment and when time and and the rest of creation is finally redeemed into whatever is going to happen 
right? God sees all of that from his singular vantage point right now. And there is from his sort of uh, supposed or imagined or um, conceptual, right? Summit of the mountain from his singular point. He is, he is the midpoint out of which all of these circles of uh, creation of the cosmos emanate from. And it is from this midpoint in, in this uh, image of the of the concentric circles moving around uh, the midpoint, right? The midpoint moves all of the circles of creation of the cosmos of time and space from himself. Um, and and he he's he's l looking out, conceiving of it, creating it, sustaining it, moving it. Uh, all from his singularity, all from his simplicity, all from his goodness. Um, these are ideas that are going to resonate and shape and, and be important uh, in, in the working out of this idea that the pre-modern person would have considered uh, their place in the world. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to uh, stop the sharing and, and come back here to full screen. Uh, hopefully these ideas have made sense to you. Uh, uh, this is, again, this is, uh, these are some of the, the meteor ideas, particularly the ideas of fate and providence and providence and free will. These are some of the meteor ideas of the constellation of philosophy. Uh, but they also offer some of the longest lasting mental images that this text gives us as well. Um, and, and they certainly play into this model of the cosmos that we've been looking at uh, here in this class. So uh, this is what I wanted to say for today. I hope that, uh, again, I hope that it has made sense and I hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, you can email me or um, contact me by phone uh, if you have questions and uh, I will see you next week. Have a wonderful week.